I want to be part of that New Testament church. I don't want to be part of that layout of sin church. I don't want to be part of that uh, church of Revelation chapter 17 as a harlot church. I want to be part of the New Testament church. Tonight we want to share on the thought of teach me to pray. We need to be taught to pray and how to pray. And it's that there is two meanings in that. We need God to teach us to pray. And we need Him to teach us how to pray. Now, really for the most part of the church world, for God to teach us to pray, it usually takes adverse circumstances. For God to teach us to pray, usually a crisis has to arrive before we really pray. Now, I'm not talking about just saying words. I'm not talking about just going through some prayer that we can say with our lips, but yet our mind is off, off on other things. It's, it's here and there, but yet we're talking with our mouth, but yet our mind's not in what we're saying. Now, the man Jacob wasn't that way. When he knew that Esau had was coming for him, it was then that he entered into an all-night prayer meeting. And he wrestled with God. He was earnest and sincere. Why? His life was on the line. I'm going to tell you, church, our life is on the line. I'm going to say it again. Our life is on the line. We're coming down to the end. Esau is in America. He is fighting. Esau is in the government. Esau is in the church today. And we better wrestle with God. We better lay everything else aside and get a hold of God and say, God, you've got to bless us again. When we come to that place, we're going to see God change our name. We'll walk with a limp from then on. We'll see. They'll know that we're in the presence of God. Teach me to pray. Chapter 11 of the book of Luke, verse 1. And it came to pass, as he was praying, in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, Teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Now go over to Matthew chapter 6. I'll use uh, that writing as the answer to, to that question of asking for God to teach us to pray. Matthew 6, verse number 9. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. After this manner, therefore pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord add His blessings unto His Word. Prayer is the most important thing that you and I can do today. It is the most important action of your life. Again, let me state, and I have been very repetitious in saying this, and I have done it for the sake of the importance of it, that prayer is a commandment. It is a necessity. It is a means of communication with God. It is your first entrance into heaven. Your second entrance will be when you die, if you're born again. Ian e. Baum said, when faith ceases to pray, it ceases to live. So simply saying outside of you praying, you do not have faith. He said also praying faith keeps the commandments of God and governs the conduct. When people don't keep the commandments of God, they are not praying. When their conduct is bad, they are not praying. He said prayer promotes righteous living. When people are not living righteous in the church, they are not praying. Prayer energizes the Word of God. Some say, well, I just don't understand the Word. Or I just don't see it like that. I don't believe it like that. But I can tell you the reason of it is. They do not pray. You just can't take the Word of God and look at it and interpret the Scriptures. It must be interpreted through prayer. I'll go another step. 
according to the Word of God, to, to firmly and correctly understand the Scriptures as it was penned by holy men of old, moved by the Holy Ghost. You cannot understand the fullness of what it means unless you have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. He gives the interpretation of the Scripture. So we must pray to understand the Word of God. A person that does not pray, pray is lukewarm. And lukewarm people will not go in the rapture. A church without prayer is like a body without a spirit. It is dead. He that does not pray is a stranger to God. If you don't pray, you are a stranger to God. Now, first of all, how should I pray? The Bible tells us in First Timothy chapter 2, in verse 1, first of all, first of all, notice that it. Underline it in your Bible. The very first thing on the agenda in the morning and the last thing on the agenda at night should be prayer. In the morning, God, give me guidance. Help me today. In the evening, God, I thank you for that guidance. I thank you, God, that you kept me today. We should be woke up by prayer and go to sleep by prayer. First of all, Paul said, supplications, prayers, intercessions. And given of thanks be made for all men. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. We are to pray. We are to lift up hands. But those hands must be holy. They must be clear of the blood of anyone. And if they're not that way, then our prayers are not heard. Paul said to pray everywhere. Lift up your hands to God. Lift up a heart that is pure unto God. He said to do it without anger. Do it without unbelief. There's no use in praying if there's unbelief there. God all responds to the prayers of faith. When men know that God means what he's saying. That's what the, high, the writer of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 said. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For they that come to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He only hears the prayers and answers the prayers of those that are diligent. If you just haphazard pray, then your prayers meant nothing. They got nowhere. But when you are as of Jacob and you begin to wrestle with God and you're earnest and sincere about what you talk to him about, then your prayers will be answered. We must go to God carefully. We must go to God in faith. Not in such a manner that we, we go into the presence of God with such a haphazard attitude no my friend we are talking about God the maker of this universe the word of God teaches us who should pray it says everyone should pray the saint is to pray and ask God for different things but the sinner is to come to God for forgiveness it also tells us where to pray the simple word would be everywhere you can pray on your job in the car at the house in the bed at church, at the table, we are to pray everywhere. How long are we to pray? The Bible tells us to pray always. It tells us on other occasions they prayed all night. In Romans 12 and 12, it talked about continued instant in prayer. We are to pray. I know you say, I can't pray too long. I can tell you the reason you have not disciplined yourself to pray. You must discipline the flesh. If you don't do it, then the flesh, the flesh will rule you. You must say, take charge of the body. As Paul said, I have beat this body into subjection. I have made it do what I want it to do. I have took, taken control of the body. The appetite of the body does not control me I control the body and the church must once again come back to that place and then it tells us in the word when to pray in Psalms 55 and 17 we're to pray morning and noon and at Mark, Mark 11 24 he tells us to pray when you desire things from God pray James said to pray when you're afflicted he tells us to pray for the sick he tells us to pray during trials pray when pain comes pray we are to pray always. There should not one day go by for a saint of God that they do not pray. I'm talking about really praying. I don't mean reciting some kind of a, a prayer that you have the ability to say it. No. I mean really praying. The Word of God teaches me I must pray. When the disciples come to Jesus, He must have been observing Him. He watched Jesus as He prayed. And the disciples said to Jesus, Teach us 
to pray. In verse, verse number 2, it tells us when we pray. Now, that tells me something. It is saying not if you pray, but when you pray. Prayer is not an optional thing. It was not something that they thought about. Well, if it's convenient, if I think about it. No, he said when you pray, and it tells them how to pray. In chapter 6 of, and verse 9 of Matthew, after this manner, therefore pray you. What manner? Here it is. He gives him the manner for you to pray by. First of all, he said, Our Father, our Father, who the saints the one that created the universe, your provider, the one that is in authority, the discipline of the church, the one that is God himself, we are talking to God. You'll get nowhere in your prayer life until first of all, you discover the fact you are talking to your father. You are talking to your provider. You are talking to the one that loved you and gave his only begotten son for you. When we get a hold of that, our attitude before God will then be different. And then second, he said you are to pray, hallowed be thy name. That word hallowed means holy. The, the writer of Isaiah said, He is the high and the lofty one whose name is holy. His name is not love, though he is love. His name is holy. That is the leading characteristic of God and that is he is holy. And when we rediscover that again, we as, as those that would be lukewarm or cold and indifferent, you will not go into the presence of God and with such a, a attitude when you realize God God is holy. He is a holy God. But the church today does not recognize Him as that one that is sacred. You know your lifestyle of worship, your lifestyle of serving God is determined by your concept of God. Your concept of God, your lifestyle is a direct reflection of your concept of God. If you have a, if you have the wrong concept of God, then your lifestyle is wrong. If your concept of God is that He's just a big Santa Claus and you can get by, then that's how you're going to live. If your concept of God is a genie in a bottle that when you need Him, that He's there, you go to the lamp, you rub it, poof, out He comes, you give Him your commands, He gives it to you. Then that's the kind of lifestyle you live. And that's what has happened to some people. They think they can live like they want to, but yet they come to God and they do not treat Him as a holy God. He is holy. He is holy. We must realize we are talking to Him. He is pure. He is sinless. He does not tolerate sin from no one. He has no pet children. No sir, my friend. It doesn't matter your status in society. He demands holiness. It does not matter what church you attend. He demands man's holiness for without holiness no person shall seek God holiness is the characteristic of God it is his name God is to be reverend he is to be honored he is an awesome God he is a consuming fire he has the ability to cut the thread of life off from you or I in a moment's time. He could simply speak the word and you would be consumed away. That's how powerful God is. That He had such power that He just spoke the word and the worlds and the universe was formed. That's God. The same one, Jesus Christ, the word of God, when He comes back in the battle of Armageddon, He's not going to use an atomic weapon. He's not going to use something that the United States has built. But Jesus Christ will speak with such authority riding on the back of that white horse that as men stand up, their eyes will consume away in their face. Their flesh shall melt from the bones of their head because the one that from his mouth shall go forth a two-edged sword. That is the word of power. The same one that spoke that moon into existence. He's going to speak on this earth and his enemy shall be consumed away right before him. He is awesome. He is powerful. He is a God of love by all beings. Had it not been for his love, you and I would not be here tonight. But in his love, he demands that we totally serve him under his lordship. He demands we totally commit everything to him. He will not tolerate idolatry out of us or adultery. He will not he will not permit it from no one. We must serve God, that awesome God, that holy God. That kind of a recognition. Then he said, What 
manner of prayer were you to pray? Thy kingdom come. When's the last time you prayed that way? When's the last time you prayed for God's purpose to be accomplished in your life? When's the last time that you prayed for God's presence on this earth? That's exactly what Jesus was talking about. When you pray to that awesome Father, as all power and anointing and ability, when you talk to Him, you talk to Him in reverence, and you talk to Him and you pray about His kingdom to come to this earth. It will come in fullness as I've already stated in the millennial. But His kingdom, He wants it to come now in a spiritual form. He wants us to pray, Thy kingdom come. He wants you and I to do that in such a manner that we know we're going to wage war against the devil's kingdom. But most of the church people will not pray that way. Because of the conflict that has entered into that. They don't want to fight. They don't want to have to to travail. They don't want to have to to be consistent in, in their lifestyle of prayer. No, but let me tell you again. We must pray, God, thy kingdom come. It is only the kingdom of God that we need. We must have God's kingdom here. Then second, he said, for thy will to be done. Again, he was telling us the purpose of God be done first in your life. And then in this earth. God, your will be done. Easy to say that. That's not hard. I can say it very, very comfortably. Saying, God, thy will be done in my life. But it's another thing for me to pray like Jesus did. When he knew he was headed to the cross, he knew the sufferings of that cross. And he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there in prayer, he agonized. He prayed with such agony till his blood became as great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And there Jesus prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. Now that was, that was one thing for him to pray that. Brother Benefield, but it was another thing when he got up off that ground and he went to Golgotha's hill and he hung there though he had the ability to call legions of angels and they would have set him free but he willfully done the will of the Father. He hung there and he paid the price for your redemption. I'm going to tell you again, we must pray God, thy will be done in my life first of all. When you do it, you're going to head to the cross cross is the only cure for me first. I'm going to follow you, Lord, but let me first. Let me first. No. Me has to die. If me is not dead, then Christ does not live here. Paul said for me to live as Christ. That's right. Now I'm living right now. He's talking about when he walked on shoe leather. He said, that's Christ. He wasn't saying, I'm a little Jesus running around. But he's saying the characteristics and the ministry of Jesus is in this tabernacle by the Spirit of Christ, which is the Holy Ghost. And that same must be applied to this congregation. It's your will, God. Your will must be done. What is God's will? That every person be saved. It is God's will that we be sanctified by the blood of Jesus. It is God's will for every sanctified vessel to be Holy Ghost filled. And it's God's will for every one of us to have the mind of Christ and work in the kingdom work of God. That's God's will. The conflict... Is our own will. What is your will? It's your desires and wants. That's what will is. It's what you desire and what you want. In other words, it's what you do. What you do is what you really are. Somebody said a hypocrite. Somebody that just don't act themselves on Sunday. They just stop themselves on Sunday. Because they live some other way. 
the rest of the week. What is God's will? I've heard people, and they've got in the prayer line before, or they've come during the altar service, and they say, Brother Larry, I, I want you to pray for me that God will let me know His will. I want to know what God's will is in my life. And I don't understand what they're saying. I can relate to what they're saying. They want direction. I want to tell you, friend, God's word is His will. And if you don't read His word, you'll never know His will. What is God's will? The laws and the commandments of God's word in His will. That's His will. He put it in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. It's the will of God to keep the commandments of God. Then, it is the will of God. We live in total obedience to Him. Sometimes it's going to mean sacrifice and suffering. When's the last time that we prayed like James said to pray? He said in James 4.15, For well, that ye ought to say, If the Lord will. If the Lord will. We shall live and do this or that. When's the last time you prayed that way? When's the last time before you began to take off and go somewhere that you inquired, is this your will, Father? We don't. You, you need not to look at me like that. We don't. We just do what we want to. We just make our mind, I'm going so and so, and we go. We say we're going to do so and so, and we do it. But James said we ought not to do that. James said we ought to check in with our Father first. And say, Father, is it your will for me to go there? Is it your will? I can tell you, folks, he ain't going to tell you not to be in revival. You don't have to ask him that. Some of you precious people sitting here tonight, you wouldn't be in some of the mess you're in financially. If you had to live by that scripture. You wouldn't be in some of the trouble you're in tonight. You had to went to God and said, God, is it your will for me to have this? Hello. But a lot of folks today, they don't. And then when they get in trouble by the benefit, they want to blame God for it. Say, look here, God, you said he's going to take care of me. No, I didn't have anything to do with that. What do you mean? You said he's going to bless me. You never asked me about it. That's good preaching. They get themselves so strapped down and so tied down financially. They, they don't pay tithes. And if they do, they, they gripe and complain about it. And they can't give in offerings. And they dare not give to missions. Because they're so tied up. And if we'll just go to God, He said, Your will for me to have this house, God. I'm going to tell you this time, He's going to say, No. He said, Your will, God, for me to have this car. There'll be times He'll say, No. Then Jesus said, Pray, give us this day. Our daily bread. I shared that with you the other night in one of the messages. He's teaching dependence upon God. That's what He's trying to train us to live by. is dependence on our Father every day. But you didn't go to the refrigerator and open it up and pray there'd be something in it. You knew it'd be there. So we don't pray, give us our daily bread. But He said to do that. Well, I'm the one that made it. No, He gave you the strength to get it. How do you know? Well, He can cut it off overnight. He can cut off the source of strength. He can put it in such a matter you couldn't even swing your feet out of the bed tomorrow morning. So we need to pray, God, give us our daily bread. And then He said to pray, forgive us our debts. Before we can get anything else done, we got to forgive our debts. Oh, God, forgive those, God. They have trespassed against us. There's no use of God praying and saying, God, forgive me my debts. Forgive me my sins. Until first, I've forgiven those who have done me wrong. Then he said, lead us not into 
temptation, but delivers from evil. What are you saying to your church, Jesus? He is saying to you and I to ask for guidance. Ask for the leadership of God. Ask for wisdom from God. Ask for God to give you instructions. This is a role model prayer. It was not the Lord's prayer. It's the prayer of the disciple. It's the prayer for the church. God lead us, guide us, teach us, and deliver us. Set us free, God, from the schemes and the traps of the devil. When's the last time we prayed that way? God, deliver me from the schemes of the adversary that he set for us. And then he gives the reason. For it is your kingdom, and it is your power, and it is your glory forever. It's yours, God. The church is yours, God. It is your kingdom. It is your power. And it is your glory. All of it belongs to Him. Jesus said to pray for those that despitefully use you. Persecute you. That's pretty hard, isn't it? You know somebody's done you wrong. Or they're doing you wrong. Or they're talking about you. Trying to destroy your reputation. Jesus said to pray for them. James said to pray one for another. When's the last time that the many churches really prayed? Even so come Lord Jesus. When's the last time we prayed that way? When's the last time that we really got away with the Lord? We said to the Lord, Turn the light on me. God, whatever's in my life, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to deal with it. When's the last time? I'm going to tell you tonight, church, in concluding, the spirituality, the power of this church is determined by its amount of prayer, consistency in prayer. Your spirituality is not determined by the fact that you talk in tongues. That, did not, that's, that does not determine your spirituality. I've watched some people in the Pentecostal church have the ability to turn tongues on and off like a faucet. Just any old good time they get ready, well, they can talk in tongues. Our spirituality is not determined by signs and wonders. Because that would be the very platform that the Antichrist will deceive the whole world. The lines, signs, and wonders. Your spirituality is not determined by your ability to perform a miracle. The spirituality of the McClendy Church of God is determined by His prayer meeting. You are no more spiritual than your prayer life. They are people that have the ability to teach a Sunday school class. They have the ability to study and put things together that sounds good and is good. But they have no lifestyle of prayer. Their spirituality is not determined by the ability to stand up and say great things as an orator. Their spirituality is not determined by that. A preacher, his spirituality is not determined by the ability to put the homiletics of a sermon together and deliver it. His spirituality is determined by his lifestyle of prayer. And the devil don't want us to know that. He don't want you to know that. He'd rather us live in such a manner 
that we let the preacher or somebody else do our praying. Or just let me get in a service and let God's power begin to move and I feel something move in me. I feel sensational feeling. And I go away feel good about going to church, but yet it doesn't change me. I have no lifestyle of prayer. Then we take it as God is sanctioning the way that we live. I say, it must be alright. You blessed me tonight. Only two people made it through the wilderness. The rest of Israel eat the manna that fell six days a week. Drank from the same rock, the same water. Caleb and Joshua did. But only two of them went into the promised land. You can go through a Pentecostal service, go through a church formalities. We can go through the form of worship. We can go through sensational feelings and still miss the rapture. We can eat and drink from the same fountain that others did and feel good about it and still miss heaven. And that's what God has brought the city that reality. Your spirituality and power is determined by your prayer life. All saints pray. All of them. All saints pray consistently. If you're not praying, you're either backslid or you're on your road. Wait to backslide. Prayer is your only hope. America is depending upon you and I to pray. Would you stand with me please?